Okay, great. Cool. Um, my name is Ian Schneider. Uh, thank you so much for having me and dealing with technical difficulties of uh, remote speaker. Um, I'm really excited to be here and really excited that this conference is happening. Um, and yeah, so thanks so much. Um, so I wanted to present today uh, as a way to sort of start off the conference and kick off sort of some a lot of these exciting technical discussions, which is I think what we're really here for and excited about um, by just talking about sort of the the way that I as, as sort of one participant in this in this in these infrastructure discussions at Google um, think about building low carbon computer systems. And so I've titled this as, um, as building low carbon computer systems. When does carbon diverge from cost? And the basic thing I'd like to help kind of sort through is you know, how do we think about um, dealing with multiple objectives when carbon might diverge from costs? And, and you know, when do we as infrastructure providers start thinking about the importance of carbon when, when making our sort of infrastructure and efficiency decisions? So I'll start today by summarizing some carbon emissions goals uh, that a company like Google has. I'll describe what I see as the opportunity space for solutions. And then I'll talk about the existing efforts that, that Google undertakes and like how I classify them. And then I'll talk more holistically about computer system carbon eventually, carbon efficiency, um, both how we're measuring at Google and, and how I think um, we can achieve it in the future. I'll give a few examples of the kinds of projects I'm interested in internally. And then I think that'll lead really nicely, hopefully into the technical discussions where we'll hear a lot of ideas about other ways to improve computer system carbon efficiency from the technical presenters. So I, I don't think I need to convince any of you of this, but computer system carbon emissions matter uh, quite a lot. So Already today, data center power is about 1% of global um, total electricity usage. And I think that the thing here that's most probably exciting for me is that between 2010 and about today, the demand for global compute instances or for servers has increased by almost 10x. Um, but my impression or my understanding is that electricity use in terms of terawatt hours for the global data center industry is about flat over that time. So if it wasn't the case that we were already doing a really good job at improving computer system energy efficiency over time, um, we'd expect that uh, global data center electricity consumption was you know, potentially 10% of our total electricity related uh, carbon emissions. Um, so what we're seeing is the really strong benefits of a lot of existing efficiency work in the space. Um, but then also because of the increased demand and importance of this industry, uh, you know, that the truth that this will continue to matter and, and will continue to grow in importance over time um, as data center demand continues to grow. So Google's energy and sustainability journey um, has been going on since 2007, or maybe even since um, the company's founding. But in terms of the presentation and the kinds of things that I'm thinking about is really important for Google in the next couple of years. Um, and the things that I think are kind of most similar to, to some of our uh, cutting edge peers in the space. I wanted to focus on two of Google's goals by 2030. Um, one of these is called 24 by 7 carbon free energy. And so the goal here is to, you know, from Google's perspective, it's to essentially completely eliminate our data center electricity related emissions. So whereas previously um, companies might have signed power purchase agreements or bought renewable energy credits to, to essentially offset their supply of electricity on a global basis, Google has a goal by 2030 to making that um, match accurately in time and in space where we're actually demanding that electricity. So, you know, previously we might've said we wanna buy as much renewable energy globally as we're gonna use in, as, as we demand in a year from our data centers. In 2030, our goal is to say, you know, for every unit of demand in every data center worldwide, we wanna make sure we're buying renewable electricity at the hour in which we're consuming uh, that power. The second goal is something that, that uh, we call net zero emissions. Um, and this, this spans all of the operations and value chain. So whereas carbon-free energy is really focused on scope two, electricity-based emissions, net zero emissions is focused on scopes one, two, and three. Um, and I'll get into a description of what those scopes mean uh, in just a second for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, but the net zero goal is really exciting because it's, it's essentially a very substantial goal. It's a goal for a 50% reduction in total um, operational and value chain emissions by 2030, paired with a reduction in the remainder using uh, carbon capture and removal. So we want to reduce our total emissions by 50% and then buy carbon capture and removal to offset the, the remaining 50%. And I'll, I'll get into this more in the presentation, but I think that's really impactful because I think it leads to us kind of turning a quarter in terms of the importance of carbon efficiency efforts internally. And I'll explain more about that. So I mentioned these scopes one, two, and three, and I, um, I you know, some of you are probably familiar with this, so I just want to highlight it because it comes up a lot in the presentation. 
So scope one emissions are direct emissions. You can think of this from, you know, from an infrastructure provider. This is basically emissions from diesel generators that we use for backup power. Scope two emissions and scope three emissions are the majority of our data center emissions. Um, scope two emissions are, you can think of them as basically data center electricity. And then the biggest sources of scope three emissions are server embodied emissions, like the emissions required to manufacture the components in the servers and everything we put in the data centers. Um, and then also the data center construction itself. So the, the, the cement and concrete and the, the whole operation re required to build the data centers. Um, you know, one thing you'll notice is that scope three is not necessarily our emissions. It's often our, you know, a partner's emissions or the, the emissions of the companies that we buy servers from. I mean, that's really important because it, um, I think for, you know, for some people like Google, it's confusing at first. It feels like there's some double counting. Like, you know, why are we, why do we care about the emissions of the server if the, the manufacturer is the one who's responsible for them? And, you know, ultimately it's included in the goals of a company like Google because it's, it's really important and because it's a major source of emissions. And because, uh, you know, Google or the GCP customers basically have a, you know, in some sense, a responsibility to help make sure that their suppliers, um, do work to reduce emissions. So Google recognizes that, um, you know, we can help reduce our suppliers' emissions by pushing really hard on on reducing reducing scope three emissions, and that's a reason it's part of our goals as well. Um, so with the scopes outlined there, I kind of want to jump into the, now the opportunity space, basically describing what we think of as, or you know, I guess I would say what I think of. This is just sort of a personal view as the the sort of basic supply and demand opportunities for reducing car, uh, computer system carbon emissions. And we'll, I'll lead this into an overall point, which is that I think the kind of op the opportunity space is changing in the future as these goals get more ambitious. And that leads to a lot of um, exciting opportunities for the kind of research that I'm, that I'm seeing presented here today. So I have this like internal personal framework of carbon emissions reduction opportunities. I basically think of things um, as having a carbon reduction potential and a cost reduction potential. So in this graph, the x-axis is carbon reduction. Farther to the right means we're doing more to reduce carbon. And the y-axis is cost. So farther down means we're doing more to reduce cost. So one thing we have is these supplier emissions reductions. Um, and this is basically things that uh, Google is, this is like most of what the Google sustainability team is doing. Like folks who work on sustainability at Google, this is what they're focused on as an effort to reduce carbon reductions. So this is things like buying power purchase agreements or renewable energy cre credits, negotiating with suppliers and trying to find uh, cleaner suppliers for servers. Um, it's work like that. And sometimes this stuff reduced costs, but usually it's more expensive. So gen you know, generally we can expect to pay a premium for a green product but it can have really major increases, uh, reductions in, in carbon emissions. The second category I think of is uh, traditional efficiency. So these are things that help save um, costs. They help reduce data center costs or infrastructure costs. And they also, um, by consequence, because they result in us using less servers or using less electricity, they also reduce uh, carbon quite substantially. So that kind of calls to mind that, that change that I mentioned earlier, where data center energy uses, usage has increased basically 10x, but power consumption is flat, right? Like if it wasn't for traditional energy efficiency or traditional efficiency in data centers, we'd expect a really big increase in, um, in carbon versus what we've achieved over the last um, 10 years. The final category is what I think of as carbon-focused efficiency. These are projects that might save a little bit of money or might actually lead to a, some increase in costs, but help reduce carbon emissions. And so far, I think at, at companies like Google and their peers, these have not been a big part of our efforts to reduce carbon efficiency or, or to, to reduce carbon emissions, to pursue carbon efficiency. Um, and so I'll, you know, I'll explain hopefully a, a little bit of why that is and also why I think that might change. I think this, this framework that I've mentioned is a little bit simplified in that I'm sort of talking about carbon focused efficiency and traditional efficiency as two different things, but I think it would be totally reasonable to also think about them as the same thing. And so if I was going to redraw this graph and do that, I'd say that, you know, when we think about traditional resource efficiency, it's all these efficiency things that save money that doesn't really matter how much carbon they save. So it's the, the green on the bottom here. Um, and what we're kind of looking at is that as we these companies care more about carbon over time, or as they kind of have more intensive carbon reduction goals, this line between red and green is going to switch. So it might move to something like this, where 
all of a sudden we care about the traditional resource efficiency efforts, but we also care about a whole class of carbon efficiency efforts that maybe don't save that much money, um, but help reduce uh, the carbon emissions associated with data center infrastructure. So I just sort of summarized those three classes and now I'm gonna kind of go into each of them, talk about what we've done in the past and then what we might do in the future. So the first example of how we reduce carbon emissions right now is dramatic efficiency improvements. This is that bottom thing here of traditional efficiency that we're already doing. So efficiency efforts, I think as a lot of you know, are a key component of, of they're, they're a key driver of carbon emissions reductions for infrastructure and for IT. Um, so you know, Google likes to trumpet this, for instance, in their 2021 environmental report. On average, Google data centers are twice as efficient as a typical enterprise data center. And I think, you know, for me, the one that's really exciting here is that Google data centers use six times as much computing power. They, they provide six times as much computing power as they did five years ago for the same amount of electrical power. So with the same amount of electrical energy, we can provide six times as much compute. Um, and so this is, these are efforts that are not typically undertaken because of carbon, but they lead to a major reduction in carbon versus the business as usual. Um, one example that Google talks about a lot is PUE. And I, I think uh, probably, some of you are familiar with this, you know, PUE is the overhead in data centers required to run all of the IT. So it's the, the cooling infrastructure and things like that that make sure that we can kind of um, reliably run a data center besides just the, the energy used by the servers. And that's decreased from about 1.22, so requiring 22% additional energy for things like cooling down to 1.1 um, over the past roughly decade. I think server efficiency is even more impactful. So uh, Dr. Kumi has written about this a lot and, and folks, some folks call it Kumi's law, this idea that the energy consumption required um, per unit of compute basically uh, declined by two, it, it declined by half every 2.6 years. So the energy efficiency doubled every 2.6 years um, over the past several, you know, uh, two to three decades. And that's you know, something that, that may continue, but it does seem to be slowing down. Uh, in some recent studies that Dr. Kumi published. There's also a sort of amorphous idea of application efficiency and things like utilization improvements that I think are, are harder to summarize. I had trouble finding good uh, global metrics on these. Um, and I think it, it's hard to right now, but they're undoubtedly important. Um, and I saw an example of a presentation later, maybe two actually, that focus on sort of software level energy consumption and carbon footprint. They'd like to be able to say, you know, what is the energy consumption of this particular block of software or this particular program that you might run on the server? I think that's really important because, you know, ultimately this is a major way in that we that we improve efficiency uh, traditionally. And so I have a graphic here of Cloud Run, which is an example of this. Um, Cloud Run is a serverless design that GCP offers, and using things like these serverless designs, cl cloud computing customers can achieve higher utilization because they basically don't need to uh, over provision servers as much, right? And so by being a little bit more flexible, flexible, or by you know, changing their performance or latency requirements a tiny bit or reliability, they can, you know, essentially end up with a product that allows them to more efficiently um, satisfy their needs. And that, that, that kind of thing reduces carbon. I, d I think I don't have a good sense of how much right now, but I think it's, it's a very important piece of this puzzle, especially, you know, that and, and server efficiency. So the other thing we do to reduce carbon emissions besides these sort of existing um, efficiency options are, are what I think of as supply side interventions. So if you were a company and you were, you know, a CEO of some new data center company comes to me and says, or cloud company says to me, you know, I want to come up with a roadmap for uh, reducing my emissions. And I wanted to get more ambitious over time. I, I, you know, I'd look to companies like Google and some of our peers and I'd say, well, they're, a lot of them are doing kind of the same thing. The first thing they do is they try to reduce their electricity emissions by improving efficiency and reducing energy consumption. And then they reduce their scope two emissions more by purchasing clean energy. And then they start reducing scope three emissions. So they start working more directly with suppliers to reduce their scope one and two emissions. And then the final step is that they compensate the remaining emissions with carbon capture. So once they've done all the above, or what this is, this is like their goal of what they plan to do by 2030, they'll basically say, we want to capture carbon equivalent to all of our infrastructure emissions. And we want to, we want to uh, bury that in the ground. Number one here is what we just talked about, and that will generally save money. But steps two, three, and four will tend to, to cost money. And four costs a lot more than two. And that's what I'll start describing now. So the supply side emissions increase costs. Um, and that those costs can vary by potentially two orders of magnitude. 
And as I'll show, that has really big impacts on some of your internal infrastructure efficiency decisions as well. So if you imagine a, a company with sort of the least ambitious, but, but still somewhat credible goals for reducing carbon emissions, their current strategy is typically to buy carbon credits for operational carbon emissions. So they'll, they'll just focus on scope two and they'll say, we want to um, you know, purchase carbon credits from say a program that uh, reduces methane leakage from, um, from waste facilities or that um, reduces deforestation in Brazil. And those companies can you know, get licensed and they can sell carbon credits. And they're, it's sometimes hard to prove that they're additional, that they're actually helping reduce more carbon on account of you buying these credits, but they, 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 they probably are at least somewhat helpful. Um, and there's a lot of variance in the cost of those programs, but they, they tend to be pretty inexpensive, um, partially because they're, they're sort of easy to do and, and maybe because they're, they're not as effective as we hope. Um, but you know, those, those programs might cost, for example, $3 per ton to reduce emissions. On the far other side of the spectrum, we have like the gold standard for reducing carbon. It's like if my data center can, you know, produces a lot of carbon emissions, the best way that I can reliably offset the carbon emissions associated with that is I can pull carbon out of the atmosphere using carbon capture, and then I can I can remove it from the um, the airstream and, and essentially figure out a way to bury it underground. And this is still early stage. It's not guaranteed that this will scale up, but I think. Folks generally forecast that by 2030, this will be readily available and will cost mostly because of the electricity required to do it. It will cost between 50 to $300 per ton to remove those carbon emissions. When we're thinking about opportunities for carbon efficiency, we care a lot about the cost of those supply side uh, things. So I just sort of outlined that there's this 2x, um, two, sorry, two order of magnitude difference in the cost of reducing carbon emissions. And now I'm going to talk about the opportunities for carbon efficiency here and how we prioritize them. And ultimately, I'll try to make the claim to you that the, the cost of the other things that we could do matters a lot for uh, what kinds of things we consider internally, you know, when we're trying to prioritize opportunities for carbon efficiency internally. So I'm going to do this by walking through sort of a sort of a simple example. So imagine that you um, are purchasing a 2019 R640 Dell server. Um, GoClimate.com has a, has a nice summary, and I'm you know, purposefully using public figures here, they have a nice summary of the carbon emissions associated with that server. So they estimate that with a four-year depreciation, the scope two emissions associated with the electricity that will be used by that server um, use about half a ton of carbon emissions per year. And the scope three emissions associated with the manufacture of that server uh, depreciated over four years are 320 kilograms of CO2 per year. So a little over half the scope two emissions. And I'm going to ignore everything else because that constitutes less than about 20% of the total carbon emissions associated with that server. The, there's also sources that show that these servers cost about $6,000 per unit. And so for four-year depreciation, that would be about $1,500 per year. And so depending on the ambition of your carbon commitment, depending on whether you're buying these $3 a ton carbon credits or whether you're, you're paying for three, $300 a ton to remove carbon from the atmosphere, the lifetime cost of those carbon emissions ranges from $3 per server per year to $300 per server per year, roughly, which is a massive difference. That's between 0.2% to 20% of CapEx. And where companies fall in that range has a, major it has a major impact on their appetite for sort of carbon focused, carbon specific efficiency efforts. And I think what's really exciting for the technical folks in this room and for all, you know, the work that you're doing and also for, for the planet and for us is that there's a shift, right? Like we recognize that a couple of years ago, it was very close to 0.2%. And I think there's reason to believe that it's changing to the point where this is really a credible and important part um, of you know, the total uh, infrastructure considerations. If it's something like 20% of CapEx, it starts to become really important to the builders and owners of this infrastructure. So another way to think about this is that, you know, I had this diagram before where I talked about traditional efficiency as being in the green and, and, and um, you know, red things as being not worth doing, right? This is traditional efficiency that's not cost effective. Well, if it's 0.2% of carbon emissions, you kind of shift this line slightly upwards. Um, and in that world, and I think that's really where we, we have been for the last few years, you just keep driving existing efficiency efforts. It's not really worth the effort to quantify carbon that effectively because most of the things you were already doing are already gonna be useful um, for reducing carbon. But on the other hand, if, if your carbon costs, the cost of meeting your goals um, would be 20% of CapEx, then you're shifting this line much more. 
you start to care a lot more about things that can help reduce carbon, even if they cost a little bit more. So then you have something went the wrong way, something like this, a really big shift in the types of efficiency projects you undertake and the opportunity space changes and grows a lot. You start to care a lot about things like SSD, right? If SSD has low enough embodied carbon, and I'm excited for a presentation later that we'll talk about that, right? If SSD has, has, an, has low enough embodied carbon and it saves um, scope two emissions, then you might prefer, um, you know, you might push more efforts to use SSD over HDD, even if they're more expensive. So to summarize, like what can we learn from the previous example? I think the example to me um, is trying to show that the carbon value and the carbon price will become a key signal to change decisions for, for companies like Google and our peers only at certain thresholds. So in the world that we've been in, in my opinion, over the past couple of years, even where these companies have stated carbon goals, the, the ability to reduce carbon emissions from supply side and from traditional efficiency efforts has kind of always been good enough and carbon emissions as a result might just be something like 0.2% of CapEx or OpEx. And if that's the case, it's probably best to just focus on traditional resource efficiency. It will still reduce a lot of carbon. But if carbon emissions start to become equi the equivalent of 10 or 20% of CapEx or OpEx, you might really start to care more about counting and, and measuring and reducing carbon emissions. Um, and I think the key last part here is that all these, a lot of these companies have fixed goals. You know, By 2030, we seek to do this. And the, the challenge of achieving those goals gets harder the closer you get to them. It's a lot easier to reduce your emissions from 10 tons to nine tons than it is to reduce them from three tons to two tons. And so the marginal value of doing things that reduce emissions um, in your infrastructure start to go up and up as you get closer to those goals. And so we might see that this, there's this shift over time, both because the goals are getting stronger, but then also because these companies are getting closer to the goals um, where the value of using um, new information to help reduce your infrastructure emissions keeps going up and up. Um, and so ultimately the, you know, that's lesson one is that like, it might, you know, the, the amount here matters. And I think lesson two is, you know, the amount here also helps you determine when it's worth it to gather more data. And so imagine um, for some, another like kind of oversimplified example, imagine you had two servers and one of them costs 1% more, um, you know, similar to these Dell servers otherwise. Well, if your carbon cost, if the cost of reducing carbon through your offsets or through supplier negotiations or things like that is $3 per ton, it's never worth it to gather the data. It actually could never change the decision. Like even if one of the servers was 90% more carbon efficient, um, you know, like the, based on the value, you'd probably still rather, or you no, know, you can run the numbers, you'd rather buy the cheaper server and then just pay to reduce things through the supply side. Um, but if carbon reductions from the supply side cost $300 a ton, it's worth it to use the 1% more expensive server if it's embodied carbon is 15% lower, um, right? At that point, you'd rather buy the expensive server, server and not do the carbon capture. Um, and then it becomes probably worth it to gather the sort of more detailed, more granular LCA data. So I think, you know, on one hand, we're seeing that the value of carbon savings from infrastructure are going up. And that's really, I think, changing the game for, for Google and some of our peers, where it's starting to become more and more valuable to get better granular data on carbon emissions so we can start incor incorporating it more directly into our decision making. Um, so I want to close by just talking about what we're doing right now, like how we're starting along that path of getting um, more granular measurements of carbon opportunities and thinking and how we're thinking about how to prioritize them. So I, I can't talk about it all, but the most prominent public example of what we're doing to estimate carbon emissions at Google is uh, GCP carbon reporting. So we're providing carbon reports to Google Cloud customers that allow them to see the, the carbon emissions associated with their with their use of GCP. And these are their scope three emissions from just from using Google Cloud. Um, and so internally, what we're doing here is we're allocating machine energy use to internal Google services. So we're measuring the, the power that a machine uses in every hour, the energy consumption of a machine in every hour. And then we're apportioning its idle power. This is the amount of power the, the server would use, um, even if it didn't have any usage. We're, we're apportioning that to the resource owners, and we're apportioning everything else to the resource users. And the, the reason we do that is because it helps recognize the benefit of things like high utilization and reduced resource use. Um, and it also helps recognize the benefit of running services at lower priority. So if you're if you're this kind of opportunistic user who's, who's willing to run on services when they're available, but doesn't, doesn't need to hold control of those servers, servers um, when you're not using them, then you kind of get associated lower carbon emissions, reflecting the fact that your flexibility makes it easier for us to run our data centers in a more efficient way. Um, and so once we've allocated this machine energy use to these internal Google services, 
we combine that with the hourly greenhouse gas emissions for the electricity grid for each of our data centers, for each data center location. Um, and so then we have carbon intensity per internal Google service per location. Um, and then we can allocate that to the GCP services and to the and SKUs. And we do that basically proportional to revenue within GCP. And that's a, that's a simple, um, very common method for a lot of this carbon accounting. It does suggest that that's sort of a boundary for us. We're getting better at doing things internally, but for GCP customers, the revenue-based apportion like, limits the ability for them to use it to make uh, some sorts, of, some types of efficiency decisions. Um, and then once we we allocate carbon emissions to GCP services and SKUs based on revenue, um, which is as I said, sort of the, the best we can do for now, um, we can then use the customer billing information to directly allocate carbon emissions to customers, um, and then report those carbon emissions to customers so that they can report on them and take action on them. Um, the, the end result here is this carbon footprint product, which is available in preview now for all GCP customers. Um, and it looks something like this, where for each GCP customer, we're breaking down their carbon footprint by project and um, by the different GCP products they use. Um, there's a few things I think of as like the frontiers of measuring carbon emissions. Like here's what we're working on next to try to get better at this. Um, the first is scope three coverage. So if you were to ask me, what's the carbon footprint of a new server with a 28 core Intel processor and a terabyte of RAM? You know, the first thing I'd ask you is like, how are we gonna get this useful information from suppliers? Um, I think it's pretty clear to us that scope three matters right now internally, um, but, but for other companies, it might not matter as much for the goals that they've set. Um, and then the thing that, that I'm really focused on a data, as a data scientist is how do we break this down per unit of compute resource? So we can say, oh, the, you know, even if we get really good supplier specific data and we can say, oh, this, component uses this much energy and this much carbon or has this much embodied emissions, we want to break it down into computer system resources. So per unit of CPU, per unit of RAM, or per GPU, things like that. And doing that translation can be a little bit challenging. Um, and then we're also interested in reconciling the average versus marginal impact of, this, of a decision. And the, the reason this is challenging is that a lot of services require a lot of upfront overhead to run. And then as they add more users, they can kind of spread that upfront overhead across more and more users. So their carbon impact per user goes down over time. And so when consumers ask us questions like, should I switch my service from X to Y to reduce my carbon impact? It's not always something we can answer because for now, we have these reports that are based on average emissions, take the total carbon footprint of a service and divide it amongst all its users, roughly proportional to revenue. And the getting that next step, the marginal emissions of these kinds of decisions is a little bit harder and it sometimes conflicts with what customers are are used to getting uh, from their carbon reports. So if that's what we're doing on sort of the measurement side, um, I want to I, I want to wrap up by talking for for just one more minute about carbon efficiency opportunities, like what we're doing um, or what we're seeing as potential opportunities in the future for actually reducing uh, some of these carbon emissions uh, from an infrastructure side. So you know I started this presentation by talking about the ways we reduce supply side emissions and the existing efficiency efforts and saying that there's this sort of nebulous area of uh, carbon focused efficiency efforts that um, we could undertake. And then I started, I, I kind of explained like why I think it matters. I think we're sort of at a turning point where the supply side interventions are gonna get increasingly expensive over time as companies get closer to their goals. And so then you might start really caring more and more about these carbon focused um, efficiency opportunities. And so now I'm just gonna close for a minute by summarizing a few of the opportunities we're considering and then I think you'll see technical discussions on a lot of other things that we should be considering. And so this is a really exciting conference because it gives us ideas about the kinds of things to focus on in the future. So the first example of a carbon efficiency opportunity is load shifting. Um, we can shift load to different data centers um, to take advantage of clean electricity at, at, at data centers um, where there's more renewable electricity on the grid or at times of day when more renewable electricity is available. So if there's a lot of wind in Oklahoma in the evening, we'd prefer to run flexible jobs in Oklahoma in the evening. Um, and this is called carbon aware computing at Google. It's something that's publicly announced, announced and launched. Um, and for cloud, we don't do this directly. We don't have like a mechanized way of doing this, but we allow customers to choose greener cloud locations and we share this information with them. A second example is storage. Um, so you'll, you'll get to see a presentation, I think actually next about the embodied emissions of SSD. Um, you know, roughly the way I think of this at Google is that we have a trade-off between HDD and SSD that's based on IO. If you need a lot of uh, input and output, choose SSD. And if you don't need a lot, choose HDD. Um, ultimately, that break-even point might change once we think about carbon. So like, if we think that SSD, once we're considering both embodied emissions plus electricity, is more carbon efficient, then we'd probably draw that input-output 
uh, inflection point down. We tell people to use SSD in more, more places because it can help reduce carbon emissions. The final example I'll, I'll suggest, and, and sorry for running through these, I, I recognize we're I'm a little over time, is that is tech refresh. Um, so right now, computer system operators tend to replace machines every four to eight years. And the basic idea is that you're taking advantage of, the, of more processing power per unit of space or per unit of electric power um, by upgrading to newer machines. And this can help uh, reduce maintenance costs. And so one thing we might consider is something like faster or slower tech refresh. So imagine you were interested in faster tech refresh. Um, that would lead to an increase in scope three embodied emissions um, because you'd have shorter machine depreciation and you'd be buying more machines. But it would decrease scope two emissions because you'd be using less electrical power and uh, energy per unit of processing because you'd be new using newer, more efficient machines on average. And then it would also decrease your need to build new data centers because you could pack more computing power into your existing data centers by upgrading them, them more, efficient, more, more quickly. And you know, one thing we're trying to answer internally is like, what's the right trade-off once we consider existing, you know, once we consider costs, but then also add carbon emissions into that discussion. Um, and I think that you know will ultimately depend a lot on sort of the value, the cost of reducing carbon from the supply side, as I mentioned before. And I think one thing that makes this really interesting is that at, at Google, and I and I, I think our peers probably notice the same thing. It's it seems a lot more expensive to reduce scope three emissions than to reduce scope two emissions. We've been reducing, working to reduce scope, scope two emissions for longer and we're, and we're pretty good at it. So here we have this interesting trade-off where scope three emissions are kind of increasingly important because they're expensive or they're hard to re reduce and therefore expensive to reduce. And so we care especially about reducing scope three emissions. And when we're considering some of these data center internal efficiency efforts, we care not just about the total emissions, but also like about the cost of reducing the emissions uh, over time through various avenues. So if we know that in five years, we're going to be really good at buying um, renewable electricity and grids are going to be really clean, we might do things now to, to really prioritize our scope three emissions because we know that's going to be harder to reduce over time. So in summary, the existing efforts for computer system carbon reductions kind of fall in tr into traditional resource efficiency or supply side carbon reductions. Like those are the things that have driven most reductions in carbon for data centers over time. Um, and then I asked the question, like, is it worth it to develop granular data and chase carbon focused efficiency, where maybe we're not saving as much money, but we're helping reduce carbon? I think that the answer to that question ultimately depends on the level of ambition of these infrastructure providers and the cost of alternatives. And I think the cost of those alternatives and the level of ambition are both increasing pretty dramatically over time, over the next five years. Um, and then I, I close by talking about a few carbon efficiency programs that, that prioritize carbon reductions. So if the cost of these alternatives for reducing carbon keeps going up, these are the kinds of carbon efficiency programs that, that we might um, start to consider and start to engage in more fully over time. And examples of those are load shifting, storage opportunities, and server replacement. And I'm excited um, to see all of the other examples of carbon efficiency work that, that, that the technical um, minds in this room will, will present over the next couple hours. Thank you all so much, um, and I, I hope you all enjoy the conference. Um, okay, so if the next speaker possibly is also online, uh, could start uh, getting ready uh, while we ask Check here. Hi, Ian. This is Andrew Chen. Um, great talk. Terrific to hear about all the exciting things that Google is doing. Um, I always like to see that plot that you showed for increasing uh, data center power consumption. Right, and the fact that maybe it's not growing as fast as, as some people were worried it was going to grow. But one of the things that was shown in your graph, and I think is something that I'm sure Google is focused on, is that the share of that power being consumed by data centers is now up to maybe almost 50% amongst the hyperscalers. So do you expect that that trend is going to change in the near future or the continued growth of the hyperscalers are going to make you know, the growth rate of data center power to you know, perhaps accelerate over the next decade or more? Thank, thank you for the, the question, Andrew. Um, I, I guess I, you know, I'm, I'm not that familiar with industry trends here, so I don't know. I think what I'm hearing from you is this idea that, you know, the hyperscalers themselves might drive um, 
an exceptional increase in, in data center energy consumption. And, you know, especially I think if they're able to provide lower cost products for, for companies, we might imagine that that might accelerate demand for, for data center products. Or even um, more and therefore more increase demand overall. Too. I mean, to your credit, right? I mean, exactly. So that's, I think the counterpoint is right. If they're, they're accelerating demand through lower costs, I think of that as like a, a good thing from an economics perspective. If they use less energy, that's another good thing. But I think we should be, you know, really focused on them um, as, as consumers of the kinds of technology that folks are talking about in this conference, um, because the decisions that they make will have a really big impact on, on data center energy consumption and carbon emissions overall. Thank you. Hey, and great talk. Uh, Simon Peter, University of Washington. Um, you mentioned, uh, so you, you generally think about carbon in the context of cost, and you mentioned the cost of gaining more granular carbon data. Um, and I was wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail there, because I felt that at the same time you presented um, your system that you already have in place to get this kind of data for at least energy consumption. Where do you see the expensive cost? Where, where do you see it being expensive to get more granular carbon? Is it on the embodied carbon, or um, where, where, is, where is that cost being spent to get that granular data on carbon emissions? Sure. Simon, thank you so much for your question. So if I, if I understand that correctly, um, you're interested in like understanding sort of this disconnect between the fact that we're already measuring carbon to some extent and the fact that I'm calling it expensive, and then um, also, like you're asking, like what the what where where it's expensive to get better at measuring carbon. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Feel free to answer in a general way. Just where where where's the cost? <laughs> sure. So, I think the the first driver of measuring and reporting carbon was GCP customers. Like we knew that our customers needed this data for their own scope three reporting, and we wanted to provide something to them that would meet those customer needs. Um, so I think that was like that was the first driver, and it was worth it to build out this functionality, um, which is mostly focused on electricity in scope two because we wanted to do that. And so now the next question is like, how can we get data that allows us to, to really drive internal decisions? Um, and you asked like, what are the sources of, of, of that data being expensive? And I think the, you, you answered this actually a little bit in your question, you, you mentioned embodied emissions. And I, and I think what we've learned is that credibly measuring server embodied emissions um, is, is expensive and, and it takes a lot of work in a large team. And I think we really, there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem, but we really feel like we need to get a better understanding of the potential variance across different components and across different servers so that we can justify the cost of getting better measurements of that and then and then surfacing that measure that information to decision makers. Um, so I think on the, the scope two side, we're, we feel like we have a pretty good sense of the energy consumption of machines, but we recognize that the cost of reducing scope three emissions in particular is really high. So we wanna get really good at measuring scope three embodied emissions, um, but, but that's something that can be a little bit expensive to, to do in a, in a way that we think meets the level of rigor required to make sure that it actually helps us reduce carbon emissions. I see. Um, now, now some server vendors do provide carbon, embodied carbon emission data, like Dell and HP, for example. Is it just not data that applies to you or is that data not detailed enough? Um. Um, so, you know, the, with the caveat that this is the team that really works with suppliers is a partner team for me. So this is an area that I'm a little bit less familiar with personally. Um, my impression is that that data um, is highly variable in terms of its quality and isn't necessarily consistent across suppliers, um, which can make for very, it, it can make it very challenging to um, make accurate comparisons. So they, they might use different methodologies, and so then we, we have to kind of figure out ways to correct for that. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Hi, it's uh, Norman from uh, UMass Amherst. Uh, I have a question about uh, the operational carbon and uh, the 24-7 carbon-free energy initiative by Google. Do you think it is the sort of end goal or because uh, like I believe that even when you are matching um, your emissions uh, at the same location, uh, at the same hour, you are still sharing the grid infrastructure and all the other carbon intensive energy resources that are being used to make that grid reliable. So maybe a better way would be to like divide all the carbon emissions 
based on the energy consumption of all the users. So in that case, you cannot be carbon free truly unless the society becomes carbon free. So do you think that 24 seven is the end goal or like what is the next step beyond that? Sure. Uh, thank you. That, that's a great question. So if I, if I understand correctly, the question is like, is 24 seven the right end goal? Because if we're using electricity system infrastructure, and the uh, electricity generation is not entirely clean, then in, in some sense, our consumption of that electricity is not entirely clean, even if we're meeting something like 24 seven. Um, you know, like from a very personal perspective, I can't speak necessarily to the team's goals or, you know, the future here, but like the ultimate end goal, of course, is to have electricity system emissions be zero. Like I, I think it will be very hard for the world to achieve its long-term climate goals if we can't drive ele electricity system emissions to, to zero or, or to near zero. Um, and so in that sense, I definitely don't think that 24 by seven is the, the ultimate goal, like the ultimate goal for society is that we need zero, zero carbon electricity. Um, the, the question you asked is something that I've heard a few times and it's usually phrased slightly differently. Um, it's often phrased as is 24 by seven the best goal now um, compared to just doing the most you can to reduce electricity system emissions in the short run by focusing on um, the marginal emissions of the power sector uh, in the place that you're located. And I think what, what the way that I think of this personally is that 24 by seven is, is sort of a way to fund and incentivize a test bed for building out the kinds of technologies that we can use to zero out the entire power systems electricity in the long run. Um, so instead of having this short run approach where we're really focused on using the electricity at the times when marginal emissions are the lowest, we're trying to sort of do this in the smaller subspace that applies to Google's data centers to, in um, to incentivize things like battery technology or demand response or hydrogen with the idea that like we're, we're helping push and pursue innovation in these places so that eventually the power sector as a whole can incorporate those technologies to have a you know completely zero carbon power sector. Yeah, so I agree sorry. with... Yeah, so I'm just, sorry, I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna okay. cut it off here so we can get to the next talk. Um, anyway, thanks very much, uh, Ian. Uh, Thank you. Uh, okay, um, sorry, I'm gonna... Uh, the person also still on...